Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Health Bridge. It's Dr. Sarah Gottfried. I'm here with Dr. Pedram Shojai. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Hey, Pedram. I'm super excited because we've got Dr. Jay Lombard with us today. And uh, Jay, I just, I'm thrilled to have you. I want to do a quick intro and just tell people about you, but you want to say a quick hi? Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. <laughs> Yay. Welcome to Welcome to modern technology. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So guys, I met Dr. Jay Lombard several years ago and it was kind of love at first sight because he was talking about the gene environment interactions and now as they relate to depression and mood issues. And then I started talking to him about PMS and like taking him to all these hormonal places that he probably didn't want to go. But I, I want you to know that Jay is just one of those Renaissance men when it comes to medicine. He is board certified as a neurologist. He's also got deep experience with psychiatry. He's um, one of the co-founders of Genomind, which I think is looking at the gene environment interface in a very interesting way. And then how many books do you have, Jay? I know you've got a book on depression that's coming out. Tell us about some of the books that you have. So the book that's coming out is by Random House. It's called Mind of God, Brain Science and Faith, um, which will be out next year. And that's really uh, my dearest work of all the books. I've written three of the books, but that book is very special to me. So um, all, of, all, all of everything I've thought about is in that book. <laughs> the other books Love were more, you know, uh, you know, the first book was the Brain Wellness Plan, which came out in 1997. It was really about sort of cutting-edge nutritional interventions for things like ADHD or Alzheimer's or depression. It was really, quite frankly, too far ahead of its time. There's an old saying that either you're too far ahead or, 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 you're, or you're late to the game. So it's a matter of getting the timing exactly right. But that book was way too early for these concepts. We, we like that approach. And, you know, the cool thing about Pedram is that he's always right on time for the party. So we'll <laughs> be hearing more about that from him. But we're going to talk today about the biology of depression. And I feel like it's such a major topic. I've learned so much from you about this, this conversation. Maybe start with... What are you most excited about when it comes to the biology of depression? Well, it's interesting. So I'm here at the Institute of Medicine, and it's a workshop with you know the who's who of people in CNS discovery, whether it's from industry or the FDA or you know various advocacy groups. And the biggest point that's been made today is that we have a inherent bias to mental illness. Um, you know, just in terms of research dollars, advocacy. Um, if you you know lose a limb or you have rheumatoid arthritis, you know the insurance company will you know pay thousands of dollars for your treatment for RA. But when you have something like depression, which we can't really see, uh, there's this inherent bias, both in terms of it being a moral characterological flaw uh, or something that you're ashamed to talk about, and that's really hindered, uh, I think, our developments in this field. So just just the concept of understanding that depression and all psychiatric conditions are at least in part biologically driven. Of course, there are environmental influences that play a role in, in these conditions as well. But just saying that, that this is biological, is a huge advance in itself. So where are we at with that in terms of the science? How much of that are, are you guys able to map out? Are you, are you seeing g genetic expression sequences that are pointing in this direction? Are you starting to see PET scan image, images? Like how, how is this starting to lay out on the evidence side? So all of the above. I think that you know, genetics has shown us that there are common genes that are you know, risk factor genes for conditions like depression or other psychiatric diseases. Uh, there's imaging technology. PET probably is overinflated, um, as is SPECT. Both of those, I think, are uh, not as clinically useful tool as uh, certain types of MRI scans, which are much better at imaging uh, sort of the brain in action, if you will. So I, I remember seeing a study uh, doing functional MRI, um, yep. and you know, in our side of the fence is you know they were doing acupuncture points and showing parts of the brain lighting up, and it really kind of uh, put ripples, you know, sent ripples through our industry and how you know this was now a way to substantiate how some of this medicine works. So psychologically, um, how do you cross that barrier? Like, are, are we seeing certain like uh, depressive? types of patients getting better through uh, uh, 
protocols that you're establishing that are you know genetically based like are you are you finding nu nu nutritional elements like help help me understand what's happening in that world I'm, I'm the guy on the other side of the fence yeah no absolutely so well, um, Jay has one foot on each side of the fence Pedro I think that even though he looks pretty conventional today for those of you on video he's at the <laughs> Institute of Medicine he's got like the doctor outfit on He's, he's actually, he does functional medicine too. So I, I just wanted to like throw that in. I was going to say, having one foot on either side of the fence is kind of an uncomfortable way to stand. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally true. It's exactly true. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. I think that uh, as we elucidate some of the genetics of these conditions, I'll talk specifically about what I think are the most exciting gene developments in depression. But that really allows us to take a biological approach that's much more specific Mm. Uh, to the underlying condition as opposed to saying that, oh, you're depressed, um, let's try Prozac, oh, that didn't work, let's try Wellbutrin, that didn't work, let's try Zoloft. I mean, that's, that's sort of these mm. empirical trials will be the way of the past very soon uh, as we learn to integrate uh, how these biomarkers uh, do help enhance treatment decisions. One very important example and something that I think, um, well, I know that Sarah and I have talked about before in the past is that there's been a link to what's called ion channels in the brain with many psychiatric conditions. And ion channels are uh, ways, sort of like a seesaw of the brain that regulates the, either the excitement of the brain or its inhibition. Um, and when that seesaw ion channel is dysregulated in some way, uh, we have mental imbalances. We also know that conditions like epilepsy, uh, chronic pain, and migraine headaches also very often find the exact same genes. And in fact, we know there's high comorbidity of conditions like depression with epilepsy and migraine um, and you know bipolar so it's a very strong overlap the importance of this is that the physiology is now being much more uh, elucidated by understanding these ion channels and that allows us to now treat these conditions uh, with either drugs or non-pharmaceutical acupuncture whatever that is where we can actually see how to, how to kind of keep those ion channels regulated in a normal way so that People are balanced. So, Jay, can I get you to be super specific about some of these ion channels? Maybe give us some examples because we had a, a show that we did a little while back uh, where I talked to Pedram about his ion channels. We tested them, <laughs> and um, I just what I think it might be. What's that? I said, "What were your ion channels?" <laughs> oh man, not good. <laughs> they were my eye off channels. <laughs> well, he he became a monk, I think, in part um, as a way of regulating his ion channels. And I I actually think you know when you look at some of these vulnerabilities that some of us have genetically, they often are these sacred opportunities to um, maybe step into some realms of life that help you regulate whatever your genetic programming is and to really activate the epigenetic aspects that we know can um, favorably impact things like ion channels. And so um, so I just want to get more specific. Are you talking about potassium, sodium? Like what's the problem? Let's get yeah. more detail. All right, let me try to, uh, you know, in, in five minutes or less, try to summarize the high level points of this. Um, Good. Think of the brain uh, as very similar to the heart in terms of its activity versus rest. So just like the heart has conduction, we have systolic and diastolic changes, you have you know the, the pulse rate that reflects the contraction of the heart and the relaxation of the heart. The exact same uh, physiological parameters that regulate the heart rate and the heart velocity um, occurs in the brain. So ion channels uh, that are in the brain um, have an effect on that balance of the brain. And these channels, uh, as you correctly pointed out, Sarah, are both calcium channels, sodium channels, and even potassium channels that uh, affect sort of the rate and the intensity of the brain's own rhythm, if you will. And we know that conditions like bipolar, which are, you know, oscillating, dynamic conditions that change, they fluctuate over time, with the seasonally or nocturnally, uh, is due to dysregulation of those pacemaker cells that depend upon the ion channels for their stability. The good news here is that there are many agents we're now learning about, uh, either pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical, that directly balance those ion channels. Um, so the opportunity here for, as, a, as a physician to treat them uh, could include things like progesterone. Uh, for instance, because progesterone is a known 
you know, has a relaxing effect in the brain specifically by targeting those calcium channels. Um, so people who have experienced, you know, premenstrual disorder, which is a condition that, you know, produces irritability and other, you know, heightened states of emotionality in some people, uh, or are hormonally do, but we now know what the effects of those hormones are on the brain, that they actually are dysregulating these ion channels. Yeah, that's yeah, great. That's I know um, I talked to you about one of my patients who did one of your tests, who was a 42-year-old woman with PMS, and her PMS was a little different than kind of the garden variety that I've been dealing with for decades. She had these paroxysms where just, you know, she'd be going along just fine, and then out of the blue, she would feel like a ton of bricks had hit her, and mm. she would have that, you know, kind of that paroxysmal or, you know, intermittent experience that you talk about with um, a genetic variant of the calcium channel uh, yep. in the brain. So what we did after you and I talked was we um, we had tried progesterone, but not in a serious way, and so we put her on some regular progesterone, and it really made a difference for her. Wow, so that's I, great. So yeah. I love this kind of, you know, getting so specific and personalized about the treatments that we offer people because giving people progesterone across the board, you know, for women with PMS, it just doesn't work. Right. Well, it was kind of a little bit uh, disheartening last night to listen to Obama's speech and, and talk about precision medicine uh, in cancer and diabetes, but not to mention precision medicine in mental health, where we really need it the most. I mean, the average... Mm -hmm you know, a person who goes to a psychiatrist or a mental health professional, it's a one-size-fits-all. And unfortunately, that uh, doesn't really uh, speak to the individual complexity uh, of these types of conditions. And the fact that we developed, you know, a technology that you're using right now and is helping patients like that, you know, makes me feel like that I'm doing something useful with my career and my life, you know, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, just kind of guesswork, which is what, unfortunately, most of how psychiatric practice takes place today. You know, it's I've been listening to. Um, I'm I'm totally getting into Audible because who has time to read? Um, and so I'm listening to uh, Emperor of Maladies, which is this kind of chronology of of the oncology and cancer and how we've been dealing with it. And you know, listening to this book has just been you know, it's like dart after dart is being thrown with different cocktails, and it's just like this was the science of oncology for years and years and years, and it was so campy and so religious, and it was like when you when you actually peel back and look at how unscientific some of the approaches were it's just like oh my goodness this is medieval chemistry and so it's really uh, encouraging to see this front uh, frontline thinking of looking at people individually and trying to figure out what their dispositions are i have a question that um may or may not bounce here which is how does this relate to say the glymphatic system and some of the detox pathways that we're finding happening with the brain? Uh, Cause when we're talking about calcium and, and, and sodium and magnesium and all these types of channels, I mean, how much of this is nutrient uh, related? I mean, have we looked at diet? Have we looked at detox and, and you know, things binding and, and uh, troubling the calcium pathways because of um, you know, lead or mercury binding to the bones? And this might be uh, kind of ahead of, of this conversation, but it's where my brain goes is like, what what are we doing to mess up these ion channels? Well, you know, it's interesting. If we if we dial back the the, the question for a second, and uh, you know, I know that so you brought up acupuncture. You know, the Chinese uh, have talked for a long time about liver dysfunction, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, we sort of said, oh, that's just metaphorical. It's representational. It really doesn't reflect uh, the adequacy of of what they're talking about, as as opposed to a meridian or some other treatment target of an organ, but. Uh, in fact, what they describe in these patients with liver congestion um, are patients with psychiatric conditions, irritability, mm -hmm. tics, uh, anxiety, uh, insomnia, hypertension. A lot of the uh, you know, mental health issues were to their framework of thinking due to liver congestion. And as we know, the liver is primarily involved in detoxification. Um, and we also know that glutathione and glutathione uh, mimetic compounds uh, are very useful in psychiatry. There's some very interesting data uh, that a compound called N-acetylcysteine, uh, which is a nutraceutical, um, is very effective in certain patients with depression, bipolar, uh, addiction, uh, substance abuse, and, and other conditions uh, based upon its ability to raise glutathione in the brain. So I think that there may be a clear link of this idea of cerebral congestion, if you will, uh, being related to you know in a, in a, inefficient 
detoxification mechanisms based upon liver uh, accumulation and reduced liver uh, ability to you know detoxify one's you know toxins that they're exposed to. If someone's listening to this and they're like, "Wow, that sounds really smart and interesting," how do I know if I have this? Like, how do you start peeling back and looking at, say, I know I know that we did genetic testing. That you know, part of the reason you know Sarah, Sarah's been working with you for a while, and that's the, some of the the genomine testing that that I had done and try to figure out what was uh, kind of the underlying conditions. Um, what can someone gather from this? And then what can people start doing for themselves or working with their physician to do to start un unraveling uh, some of these things and, and working out of you know the, the hole that they're in? So I, I don't think it's a, a be-all or an end-all solution, obviously. I think it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's, an, it's a valuable piece of the puzzle because genetics does represent you know one of the components of psychiatric conditions. It's certainly not the only one. Uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, environment um, and just you know common sense things I think go a long way uh, in mental health. Uh, ideas like connectivity and, and relationship are, you know, in my mind, one of the most fundamental aspects of the biology and the uh, phenomenology of psychiatric conditions is disconnectivity uh, that we seem to uh, grow as time goes on in our societies um, as being sort of a, a call to uh, improving our connectivity. Uh, what's interesting to me as a neurologist is that that also is biologically represented. In other words, when we do imaging studies of patients with psychiatric conditions, we can see that this disconnectivity actually is reflected on, on functional MRIs and other types of scans. Mm. Practically speaking, though, um, if a person has failed medication uh, or uh, is defined as treatment resistant because they've, they've had an adequate antidepressant trial, uh, then doing genetic testing may be very strongly helpful uh, to elucidate, you know, both uh, uh, their drug metabolism, so certain people just cannot metabolize drugs properly, and that leads to all sorts of serious adverse effects because the majority of psychiatric drugs are metabolized by the liver. Uh, and two, we can learn more about some of the, you know, things like ion channels uh, and brain chemistry, We're looking at dopamine and serotonin and other uh, neurotransmitters that play a role uh, also in the physiology of depression. What that allows a clinician to do is to, to have a more specific way of treating that patient uh, with either a pharmaceutical or nutraceutical agent that can raise dopamine or modulate glutamate or other neurotransmitters that are involved in that psychiatric disorder. So I want to ask another specific question, Jay, just so we can make sure our listeners are kind of connecting the dots and understanding how this is relevant to their lives. Could we take MTHFR? And just talk about, okay, if you have the normal variant of MTHFR versus the uh, heterozygous or homozygous variant, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what's your risk of depression? What are some of the things that can be done to modulate your risk of depression? I just think it might be helpful to take one gene, even though we know all these genes interact and it's much more complex than just one gene, one action. So MTHFR is a common gene variant, which is both good news and bad news. The, the good news about that is, is that it, it can point to a, a potential interventional strategy that we would otherwise not know about. Um, so to explain a little bit about how the folic acid methylation pathway works, uh, related to the MTHFR gene is that methylfolate plays a role in sort of the health of neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, one of its effects is to uh, increase the synthesis of serotonin and dopamine by acting as a cofactor in those enzymes. So people who have genetic defects in some of these MTHFR uh, gene variants uh, leads to a reduced uh, functionality of the methylfolate pathway. Um, and knowing that allows clinicians to uh, use methylfolate as an augmentation strategy. So things people who've We've, we've achieved a certain level of antidepressant response. Uh, researchers found that if you add methylfolate, that in a significant percentage of those patients, uh, you will get a better antidepressant response than if you had not done that. Uh, and that is a clear biologically mapped pathway where the genes uh, that have that variant show that there is a decline uh, in methylfolate utility, and those people are the ones that benefit most from using a dietary supplement like methylfolate. That's great. Quick follow-up question. So if you have one of the genetic variants of MTHFR, 
Your increased risk of depression is approximately how much? The last data I saw was about a 30% increased risk, 1.3x on up to 4x. What, yep. What's the latest? Right. So it's, it's a very hard question to answer specifically, but those numbers are, are probably correct, um, that the odds ratio of having a variant uh, will put you at a higher risk of, of having a condition like depression. Um, so, you know, that is a useful tool because most doctors don't think about methylfolate as a treatment for depression. Um, and this is work that's been done by uh, Mauricio Favre at Mass General. He really deserves most of the credit for a lot of this research to really make this mainstream. You know, 10 years ago, people would be like, what? You know, using methylfolate for depression? But you're right. It's, it's a vulnerability risk factor that should be looked at in, in patients with depression. Very clearly, I think, the answer to that data. How do we get this type of thinking into your general doctor's office? I mean, it just seems like Main Street is so far from from this level of detail and, and drill down into uh, some of these algorithms that could really, really help people and turn their lives around. It just how, how do we help get doctors to understand that this is this is even a thing? Well, I think you're doing it right now by you know your program. You're raising awareness by <laughs> the fact that you uh, have that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, you know, it says that unfortunately, it takes about 17 years for discovery to become mainstream. That's the average what? time. What? Yep, 17 years. <laughs> uh, so I think that that'll be accelerated with the internet and with you know all digital technology. I think we'll see a more rapid uh, adoption of these types of technologies. Um, and I should say that you know I'm I'm agnostic when it comes to genetics and psychiatry. I think that you know there'll be lots of biomarker tools that are coming down the pipe. They'll be very important for us to understand proteomics, uh, the role of inflammation, and having you know doctors screen for inflammatory pathways, uh, and using agents which reduce inflammation is going to be you know clearly uh, another toolbox uh, you know uh, treatment for patients with psychiatric conditions, um, and I think we'll see more of those kinds of developments as well. You know, the problem, so one of the things that we're talking about to answer your question directly um, here at the IOM today uh, is this, you know, delay in the pipeline. Um, and part of the reason for that delay is, quite frankly, it's a very expensive, uh, you know, proposition for drug companies to get a discovery drug into the clinic and then go through clinical trials. And drug companies, unfortunately, for better or worse, I'm not sure how you, you, how you think about this, but there's been a significant de, uh, de divestment in uh, brain uh, pharmacology. It's just the risk is too great. So the research for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, depression, schizophrenia is, is now being shifted almost exclusively to oncology and infectious disease. So that's a big problem. Um, so to answer your question, uh, it takes sort of grassroots efforts like what you're doing here to raise awareness and hopefully, you know, it, we start with, you know, every person's important, right? So it's not, you know, 100,000 people. It's that, that one person we make a difference in, you know, we've done our job well. If we can get one person better, that, that is great for that one person. So it's, you know, would I like this to be a bigger awareness? Of course I would. Um, but it's a, it's a slow process. It is a slow process, but we don't have 17 years. So for our listeners, we want you to, like, help us spread the word. <laughs> Let people know about this and let's start fighting that bias against mental health. So, Jay, yeah. I want to talk to you about your passion project because I'm super excited about it. Maybe we could start with the title of your new book. How did you come up with this title? Mind of God, right? Yeah, Mind of God, uh, Brain Science and Faith. And uh, Patrick Kennedy, who I'm with today, actually wrote the foreword to it um, because he uh, and I are on the same page about this passion. Uh, you know, one of the other titles that we were working on uh, was Making the Invisible Visible. That, you know, through uh, the uh, development of technologies like brain imaging, we can really now see that these are biological conditions like, um, you know, any other medical condition. But more to the point, I think, is the, is the flip side of the equation, which is that our consciousness is not only biological. I think that the, the movement of neuroscience today uh, will become more quantitatively oriented is we are devaluating sort of the subjectivity of consciousness and devaluating the uh, the inner um, privacy if you will of our own of our own being uh, and I think that you know we think if we think of our brains as computers or as machines 
which we now are thinking of them as, it's a very slippery slope uh, in terms of devaluing our humanity. I think we really need to be very conscious, again, uh, to your point about sitting on both sides of the fence here, at one time I'm arguing for more biology, and at the same time arguing for understanding that beyond the biology uh, are our souls. You know, we can call it something else, but that's what we're talking about here. And I think we need to have a very deep respect for our souls, both uh, personally and also in medicine. So the book really is about sort of that that debate that goes on in neuroscience about thinking about us as these quantitative, you know, machine-based types of you know organ systems. How that's not true, um, why it's not true, and what the implications of it are if we if we go down that road too far. That is awesome. That is <laughs> that is music to my ears. It's funny you follow the metaphors of how we talk about all this stuff and you know it, it really reflects the technology we're talking about you know the machinery and the clock and, and how they used to look at astronomy and, and then we went to the steam engine and how it powers things and now we're talking about computers and you know it's it's almost you know our brains trying to find a way to uh, make sense of something that we can't quite understand yet and so I, I love that I think that's a very uh, very important conversation so so I missed this part is the book out or is the book coming out no, no, the book's not out yet. I just yeah. uh, literally yesterday sent in the uh, first draft to the editor, so I'll let you know if uh, uh, you know what his reactions to the theme is. <laughs> Tears it apart. Right? <laughs> That's right. Next time I, on the, there, there is no book. What happened to it, Doctor Lumber? <laughs> <laughs> A couple of glitches there. <laughs> hopefully, he'll like it. But no, it's it's this is very early on. So maybe hopefully when the book comes out, I'll come back and. You know, talk about the book more specifically, but yeah, it's all, it's still a year away. Got it. Well, we'd love that. That's I'm I'm Jones and Ford already. So, so I I'm especially interested in how you quantify wellness, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask the flip side of the statement that you made that our consciousness is more than biological, and I I just wonder, as a neurologist, if you could help me understand. How do we quantify qu consciousness? Like, how do we, how do we think about it? How do we approach it? Because I feel like that's the first step in sort of understanding consciousness, as well as realizing that it's beyond the biological. Right. Which is kind of a, a you know, sort of a, a, a contradiction in itself, right? How do you, how do you quantify something that you're saying is is not quantifiable, right? It's it's, it's ultimately qualitative. Um, I think the closest we're going to get to understanding consciousness from a biological perspective, uh, there's an area of the brain uh, It's called the, the default mode network, or DMN. This is work that was done by um, a group at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, what they discovered is that when we experience uh, any type of you know, deep self-emotion, whether it's forgiveness or, or love or, or something else like that, that the highest area of the brain that's activated is this default mode network. So it's sort of like the, the locus, if you will, the closest locus in the brain is this, is this web, if you will, of converging circuits in the brain um, that seem to be the sense of self, the sense of I. You know, where, where do we, you know, where does Sarah actually in her head exist? Now, in terms of quantifying that, um, the most optimistic I am is this type of brain imaging Actually, that a lot of the lead people are actually close uh, to where you are in the uh, the Northwest, uh, called DTI imaging, diffusion uh, tensor imaging, or D or uh, diffusion tractography. We can actually assess the freedom. It's kind of interesting that the, the words that we use here. Um, we can actually assess the the freedom of movement of water in the brain. That that is the the, the closest we can get to understanding a diseased brain from a non-diseased brain is how unrestrictive the movement of water is through these, these axon tracks. Um, and we even call it as such. We say that this, this, this brain has more freedom <laughs> to flow. Um, and that's actually quantifiable. It's something called FA levels or fractional anisotropy. if you really want to know, uh, where we can assess FA levels quantitatively uh, to look at disease states. And that's, I think, the future of, of neurology uh, in general, be specifically around those types of quantitative assessments, ultimately, because that'll that'll sort of transcend any diagnosis. Mm. You know, how free is your brain? 
we talk about that in Zen all the time, right? It's the fluidity of the brain. It's, it's funny how the metaphors carry over. Um, I would love to see some uh, analysis of getting some some yogis and some meditators and some qigong practitioners and and looking at FA levels and, and and seeing if you know ten weeks of turning on a certain practice can could increase that fluidity and and if those guys are already doing that work, um, I, we're super interested. Uh, that's that's amazing stuff. I think that's really uh, that's avant garde um, for for most medicine, but I think that's where all the the, the brightest minds are looking right now is is kind of bringing those worlds. Together together and yeah qu- uh, you know quantifying uh, something that may or may not be quantifiable is, is really the question at hand and that's that, that's a that's a fun one that's a really fun one <laughs> it well, is it a takes, fun one. Oh, oh go ahead take, Jay no it takes us back into metaphor right and it takes us back into looking at not literal translations of religious writings but more understanding the metaphors of those things right so you know, and then back to the biology. So things like light, you know, being enlightened, you know, all those types of concepts. We now have optogenetics where we're actually using light to, you know, heal patients with Parkinson's disease. So it's all, it all comes back to this balance between, you know, the qualitative and the quantitative. And being able to embrace both of those, I think, is really, you know, medicine is an art and a science. I think we forget that by our, our drive to quantify things. And, you know, I think that we're also becoming a society where everything is overly explicit. You know, there's nothing implicit anymore. And that, that concerns me socially that we're so explicit. Everything is, has to be explicit. You know, what, don't we have implicity? Hmm. You know, so anyway, that's what the book is about. A little bit about my ideas and research and I uh, hope I didn't bore your, your uh, listeners too much. <laughs> Are you kidding me? We want to like keep you on for the next three hours because this is such a fun conversation. <laughs> so as you look at the flow of water in the brain, kind of the freedom of water and how it flows or the Zen brain, really it's, it's all about growth. Like the more flow that you have, the more growth you have. And I also feel like the, you know, some of us think of flow as being God as being kind of the source energy. It's one of the, the ways that I conceive of God and higher power. Yeah, I think that's, that's very, very accurate. I think we, you know, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> 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 hmm. Yeah, Andrew, what? Do you, do you have some last questions? I know we're both I, just I have like, questions. Hey, hey. Yeah, I have questions that will drag us in the next week, though. Um, <laughs> You know, there, there's a, there's one that's that's really pressing that I do want to just touch on, and this might be a, a different show altogether. Is you know, I was looking at some of the stuff that showed when you started to see increased cortical density up in the prefrontal cortex, how there was uh, f- uh, more photon activity and more kind of light emission as as things were starting to happen. Like kind of the condensing those neurons was creating a little bit more uh, light activity, actually lighting up in the front of the brain. I don't know if you could speak to that. If that's you know, your your uh, uh, part of that research, but to me that's fascinating because in the esoteric realm, you know, you light up your third eye and then you become a light unto thyself type of thing. And so there's actually a, a language of light that's uh, very well articulated in, in my Taoist practice and in, in yogic practice and all this kind of stuff. And when we start talking about light as med- medicine and the ability to generate light from within and, and, and use that as a languaging system in the brain, that to me is absolutely fascinating and i don't know if that's you know a, a rabbit hole we want to save for another uh uh call or something but I, you know if 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 that's something that you can speak to just briefly and then we could kind of go from there I just, and that might not be your your wheelhouse well it's not my direct wheelhouse and i can certainly yeah. point to the people who are are doing sort of the real work in fact it's at most of it's being done at mit sarah so you'd be interested to know that they are you know, looking at ways of, you know, tagging certain proteins um, that go into cells and sort of waking up or, you know, resuscitating dead brain cells um, or at least circumventing uh, the cells that uh, are dead and enhancing the ones that are still alive. So when people have, let's say, a brain injury, a severe brain injury, um, whether it's, you know, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or a stroke and being able to activate, you know, circuitry which has been shut down because that injury uh, by using, you know, gene-based light therapy. It's quite remarkable um, that that's where we're at. And that, that'll be, I think, probably the most significant breakthrough for these conditions in the near-term future. But it is a big, big discussion. It's something that I'm, you know, not, 
you know, overly familiar with. I think if you're interested in that topic, I can certainly point to the people that uh, probably would come on the show maybe to talk about. It. I'm not sure. You know, but yeah, yes, you know, please. Far, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, as far as your listeners go, it may, it may not be as practical as some of the things that we talked about today, mm -hmm. but, you know, that, I think people would be very interested in that topic. Yeah, then now we're getting into conjecture and, and, and really getting into some interesting places for the future. Um, okay, so let's bring it back real quick because, yes, a year from now, everyone's going to buy your book uh, because that sounds awesome. Uh, what can people start doing right now to start looking at their... I mean, we did we did mine. Sarah read mine publicly <laughs> and, 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 and really started... He's a very kinda, brave man. <laughs> I mean, would that be a good way to start uh, talking about that? I mean, I you know certainly don't mind... Uh, doing, you know, sort of a, a curbside if you if you want, or we could just discuss it in general. I mean, now, what would be best for your listeners? You think, your um, viewers, peel it back. Yeah, we got both, right? Yeah, peel it back a little. I mean, Sarah, if you're if you guys are okay on time, we'll just pull through the other segment. I'd love to, you know, we got a genius on we got a genius on the line here. So, wait, so you're asking me to recall from memory from six months ago <laughs> what your results were? Come on, Sarah. <laughs> oh, man. My hippocampus. My hippocampus. Things okay. hurt. So we, I remember that you had a genetic variation with your calcium channel ions. So we, we talked about that already. And I, I don't recall, Pedram, did you, were you maybe heterozygous for MTHFR? It seems like you and I were the same there. I think we were the same, and I could pull it up. But yeah, I mean, and this isn't a call to like go through Pedram stuff, but more in terms of <laughs> what what we can get gather from that in terms of lifestyle, right? So assuming you know I'm I'm not you know my methyl donors aren't there, or if I'm not you know I was I was uh, driving too much dopamine. So once we know that information, where do we go from there? Like what what you know? And Sarah kind of gave us some lifestyle parameters that were really uh, useful, and I thought uh, you know over the last couple months has been really helpful uh, for me. Um, and so is that where kind of an interventional psychologist or neurologist or psychiatrist can step in and start creating lifestyle parameters based on this in a in a reasonably scientific way? So I, I think that you know the the elephant in the room that we haven't really talked about that much. That's very important to this whole discussion. Uh, and to Sarah's point is epigenetics, right? So epigenetics means that it's not just the genes that you have. Uh, it's also very much uh, important to understand the effects that the environment has on the expression of those genes. Uh, and regarding the, the brain and its overall health and well-being, I think that the, the fundamental uh, you know, downstream effect is really cortisol-related, that you know, stress... Um, that produces, you know, abnormal changes in cortisol, uh, produces, you know, increased risk of depression. Uh, it increases one's risk for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Um, and cortisol is like, you know, it doesn't cause any specific disease, but it's involved in, in almost all neuropsychiatric conditions in one way or the other. And the problem with cortisol is, is as follows. One is it's not, most measurements are not very reliable uh, because it has a uh, circadian flux, so if you do a spot cortisol, levels may be considered normal, but really it's better to check, you know, an AM and PM cortisol to see if uh, the changes are really there. You'd expect cortisol to be low at night. Uh, if it's not, that may be a sign that there's persistent elevated cortisol. Um, we also don't really have, uh, I think, uh, a good understanding, at least from conventional medicine, how to regulate cortisol uh, pharmaceutically or non-pharmaceutically or through lifestyle. So I think the first thing to do is to understand the relationship of cortisol to genetics and also to the brain. Uh, number two, it's not only high cortisol. There are people who actually have low cortisol. That could be equally as detrimental in certain uh, you know, individuals. And I, I think three, we need to have better tools to actually uh, modulate cortisol. So there are compounds like phosphatidylserine, which is uh, you know a health food dietary supplement that's been shown to have uh, interesting effects on reducing cortisol. Um, L-tryptophan uh, also has been shown to have a beneficial effect uh, on cortisol. Interestingly, and I was hoping that you would have had a serotonin transporter gene defect because we know that there's a direct relationship of the serotonin transporter to problems with cortisol and that may be the link between the genetics and the epigenetics that those people who have higher stress vulnerability due to altered serotonin uh, effects 
then have um, you know, disturbances in cortisol as the proximal smoking gun, if you will, of these neuropsychiatric conditions. Once we understand that, then you know, using uh, cortisol modulating agents, whether it's ashwagandha or L-tryptophan or phosphatidylserine um, or hormonal replacement in patients who have low cortisol, uh, really opens up a whole window of opportunity to treatment that conventional doctors uh, don't have those tools yet for. So Jay, I want to I want to jump in here for a moment and talk about the serotonin transporter gene because I am like totally fascinated by it. I sat riveted in your dinner lecture, whatever that was, three or four years ago when you introduced me. <laughs> I think it was. Okay. So you introduced me to the short serotonin transporter, and I think it might be helpful just to talk a little bit about you know the the normal version of the gene, the long long the um, heterozygous short long and then the short short serotonin uh, transporter gene and and what are some of the phenotypes that kind of fit along that spectrum when you were yep. describing it and you were talking about you know the people with the short serotonin transporter gene and how they had more stress vulnerability they were basically crazy pants and had a higher risk of PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder I was like I know I have that <laughs> <laughs> and then right. I was long long go figure <laughs> It blew the whole story for you, didn't it? It totally but, you did. Know, so, so first of all, the, the work started with uh, a Duke researcher named Dr. Caspi, published his paper in Science, I think, in uh, the early 2000s, that looked at the, the, what's called the gene environmental effect of you know, stressful situations for likelihood of developing depression or PTSD. And what he discovered was that if you are a homozygote serotonin transporter, short, short, Okay, which is one of the tests that we screen for at Genomine, by the way. I think we're the, one of the only ones that clinically do that. Uh, that you know, there's a linear relationship between that gene and higher stress-related vulnerability to things like depression and PTSD. Um, it doesn't mean that people who have short shorts are going to become depressed. Um, it doesn't mean that people who have long longs don't experience stress or develop depression. So what it does mean is that there's a higher proclivity or a higher vulnerability in those individuals based upon a gene environment interaction. Now, one of the questions to ask is, well, how is that useful clinically? Why is that a beneficial test to have? And the answer is that, A, uh, people who test for short short, I think, should be screened for cortisol uh, more robustly to, to look at cortisol levels as being, uh, you know, a smoking gun. Um, whereas people with long, long transporters, it may not be cortisol. It may be a different molecular system that's involved in depression. It could be cortisol, but it's less likely to be cortisol. Um, and if it's cortisol that's elevated, we know that there are agents that are more efi efficient at lowering cortisol. Um, and from a you know, mind-body medicine approach, you know, things like meditation or, or physical exercise you know, are the single best ways. Physical exercise is by far the single best mental health recommendation we could make for anybody with depression or memory loss or ADHD, you know, simple, you know, interventions, but they're, you know, they're inexpensive and, you know, who, uh, who benefits from them financially is part of the problem. But, you know, so to getting back to your Sarah with, with the long, long transporter, I mean, that may not be what is your primary reason to have sort of a, a lower stress trigger. There's another gene that actually is coming out that we're studying called FKBP5. Uh, that, because I know you're a hormone specialist, so FKBP5 is a cortisol shuffling protein, if you will. Uh, its main effect is to make sure that cortisol only stays around uh, for a short period of time and gets, gets disposed of properly. People who have that gene variant uh, have even a higher rate of PTSD and stress-related depression than the short transporter. And this is work that's been, you know, validated much, even to a much greater degree than Dr. Caspi's work. So that that gene FKBP5 uh, may be, you know, a better biomarker uh, to see what people's stress vulnerability related to cortisol actually is. Very helpful. Very okay, helpful. so I'm going to test my FKBP5 next week. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I want to just say a quick clinical thing here. I started running your assay, your Genomind assay, a few years ago in my practice. And I've had a number of women who have the short, short version of the serotonin transporter gene. 
And what I found was that um, they, they have very developed mind-body techniques that I think they've used to successfully navigate this genetic variant. And um, I would say they're, they're almost mystics in terms of their, um, how they've developed this aspect of themselves. The other thing that I did with these women at your suggestion was to give them P5P, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. And all of them, kind of universally, this is not a controlled trial, but all of them said, you know, overnight they had a dramatic change in terms of taking wow. P5P, oh. which is activated vitamin B6. So right. I don't know that I ever gave you that feedback, but it was oh, just it, incredibly helpful. That's that's very helpful feedback. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know, B, uh, uh, B6 is one of the forgotten B vitamins for, you know, enhancing sort of, you know, well-being of the adrenal glands, basically. It's one of the main ways that it affects cortisol. So that's really interesting. I love hearing all of these uh, systems. We're talking about all these elaborate uh, genetic markers and, and brain chemicals. And then all of a sudden, the listeners get looped back into cortisol and lifestyle. And, and, it, just, it, and it just shows... Which we talk about every show. Which, yeah, it's like all roads lead to Rome here. And, and it just goes to show how modern life has you know, compressed us and stressed us and, and kind of put us in positions where we have all these really elaborate uh, you know, markers and, and things that we're starting to understand and, and oftentimes they come back to lifestyle. Um, it's not you know uh, being dismissive of the science, but it says you know good, clean, healthy living uh, goes a long way no matter what we're looking at. Um, and then we start getting just so much smarter and, and drilling down deep into you know the specifics of what's causing uh, a lot of these psychiatric conditions and, and problems that people are having in their lives. So I, I think that this is the future of medicine. I mean, this conversation is so fun. Um, and anyone who's listening, I hope you guys gathered um, where the science is going with this and how, you know, there's a lot we don't know, but a lot we are learning very quickly. Um, and this this is the conversation that needs to be had at every medical school. Uh, Doc, I think I think this has been uh, very enlightening for, for us on the call, and I hope our listeners um, have, have got a lot from it. Where can people find you? How can people get these assays? Do they need to ask their doctor? I mean, how, how does it work? Yes, they do need to ask their doctors. Uh, our website is www.genomind, spelled G-E-N-O-M-I-N-D, genomind.com. And they could navigate through that website uh, probably better than I can, actually. And, you know, their doctors, a lot of times a good psychiatrist or a mental health professional will be very uh, open-minded and, and curious when they see who's on our board and that this is, you know, real science. Uh, hopefully they'll be open to reaching out to us because you know, individuals have to get tested through their physicians. Fantastic. And enlist your doctor. If you're listening to this and this sounds interesting to you, enlist your doctor in working with you to do this. Not only will it help you, it'll help your doctor help hundreds of other people once they start wrapping their brain around this. So, you know, a lot of times it's just exposure and, you know, they're, run they're running around on a hamster wheel just trying to, you know, stay in managed care and, and, and you know, keep their head above water. Uh, and But their intentions are good. So, you know, help them also be able to become better at what they do through some of the, the science and cut through those 17 years, I think is a, is a, is a pretty good place to start here. Um, Sarah, do you have any uh, parting thoughts you know, here? <laughs> you know I do, I, yeah. I can't help myself. So I have one last little question, Jay. I hope you'll, you'll indulge me. So I was thinking about the happiest man in the world, Mathieu Ricard, and some of the data that was collected at the University of Wisconsin with um, uh, what's his name, Richie Davidson, and yeah. they, you know, they looked at his uh, brain waves. They hooked him up to I don't know, 228 leads. They did his EEG and they looked at um, his gamma waves, which were off the chart. And it only takes you know five hours of meditation a day to become the happiest man in the world. And I just <laughs> wonder if we have any information about some of these super meditators, super monks and their genetic profile. Like, is this all environmental? Do we know anything about kind of the genetics of people who have the mind of God? Well, I, you know, I think that, you know, we have to, and this is just my little soapbox to answer the question about, so we, we, you know, we've made in our society happiness our, you know, ultimate achievement in life. And I think that one of the paradoxes are that the more we chase happiness, the, the less, you know, likely we are to find it. 
Um, you know, I don't know that individual personally, but I could tell you that you know one of the simplest ways of of achieving happiness is by deflecting our attention away from ourselves and looking for a cause greater than ourselves, whether it's you know an individual or a social cause or something that we truly believe in is higher than ourselves. Uh, that is you know a very very tried and true method of you know seeking if not happiness you know deep satisfaction uh, and a purposeful driven life. So I think that we kind of have to change, you know, I, I thought about the title of my book being instead of the self-help book being like the non-self-help book, you know, sort of like, you know. <laughs> the be of service book. Yeah. yeah, be of service book, exactly. Be of service book. And I think that's, I know why, yeah, that's why you became a physician. It's why I became a physician. And it's kind of lucky to get a career where we can actually, you know, both help people and, and, and it be a career. So I think it's, you know. We're the lucky ones, but uh, I think all of us can find ways of, of, of a deeper level of contentment by discovering you know, ways of helping people beyond themselves. Okay, man. There's obviously people that are in need of help all over in every community, and you, that doesn't mean you're you're reading their labs. You could you know be working a soup kitchen, whatever it is, be of help. I think that's that's a powerful message. Uh, Dr. Jay Lombard, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, and we know you're at a conference and you took some time out to be here with us, and uh, we're honored. Give us the website one more time. Sure, it's uh, www.genomind.com. -E Fantastic. Yep. Thanks Thank very you, much. Sarah. Thank you, Jay. We'll see you when your book comes out. You.